Hello and welcome to Plug Life Television episode 4 and we have another EV myth to dispel for you as part of the Under the Bonnet Electric Vehicle Battery Misconceptions webinar follow-up that I've been doing recently. This particular misconception comes from halfway around the world where a number of ChargeNet NZ users from New Zealand were misconstruing the reason why ChargeNet NZ rapid chargers cut off at 95% and thinking that charging all the way up to 100% damages the battery. So today's question is does it harm your EV's battery if you charge it up to 100%? Well, allow me to demonstrate that actually the reason for charging the NZ's limit is actually quite commonsensical. And in terms of charging up to 100% on your EV battery at home or at work, really not an issue whatsoever. ChargeNet NZ Rapid Chargers will charge an electric car up to 95% state of charge, or SOC, then cut off. This has apparently led to some speculation amongst EV drivers that this limit has been set because it might be bad for the battery to charge it up to 100%. Rest assured that this is not the case. The ChargeNet NZ limit is actually born out of common sense. When an EV is rapid charging, it will usually take on a high charging power up to about 80% SOC, at which point the power starts to markedly taper off, to the point that you'd be just as quick using a destination charge point and freeing up the rapid charger for someone else who needs it. In order to understand why, let's look at what's happening at a cell level. During rapid charging, as current is delivered by the rapid charger at a constant rate, the cell voltage increases towards its maximum limit, which it must not stray over for safety reasons. When this is reached, the power has to be throttled back. As we learned in the first episode of Plug Life Television, power is equal to current times voltage. So in order to keep the voltage from straying over Vmax, we need to throttle back the current and by extension, the power delivered by the rapid charger. The end result is that it takes about the same amount of time to charge from empty to 80% SOC than it does to charge from 80 to 100% SOC. With that, might as well use a destination charge point crossover reached somewhere around about 90%. Consequently, it doesn't make sense to rapid charge all the way to 100% because it's a waste of everyone's time, including anyone else waiting to use the rapid charger and, crucially, yours. It's also worth highlighting that no Type 2 PHEVs or plug-in hybrids are capable of rapid charging and therefore should only stick to destination charge points, thus freeing up rapid chargers for EV drivers in a hurry. But what about that myth that charging to 100% state of charge damages the battery? It's true that cells don't like to be held at extremely high or low voltages for long periods of time, but the car's battery management system has already factored this in. All EVs have SOC buffers at high and low SOC, whereby they keep some of the cell's true capacity in reserve and never use it. The upper SOC buffer prevents cells from being overcharged or degraded due to being held at high SOC, and the lower SOC buffer prevents degradation due to overdischarge. As a result, when your EV's dashboard tells you that it's fully charged, the reality is that the battery pack is probably somewhere in the mid-90s, with a similar margin when the battery is at 0%. The most extreme example of SOC buffers is the Chevrolet Volt, which only uses 60% of its pack's true capacity by having 20% SOC buffers at the high and low end of its state of charge. In contrast to the misconceptions of some ChargeNet NZ users, charging your EV to 100% SOC actually helps to keep the battery in good condition. This is because it helps to balance the pack. Ideally, the state of charge of cells in an EV's battery pack should rise and fall as one, but in reality, each cell has a subtly different capacity, and so some reach their maximum voltage before others. Without balancing, there will be a discrepancy in the SOC of individual cells in the pack, which will become exacerbated over time and reduce the health of the pack. Therefore, the battery management system balances the pack by allowing cells at a lower SOC to slowly charge back up to their maximum voltage, bringing them in line with the rest of the cells in the pack. There are two ways to do this. In passive balancing, bleed resistors are connected across fully charged cells, whilst other cells are still charging, thus dissipating excess energy as heat. This is cheap to implement, and thus is found in the vast majority of EVs, but is inefficient. In active balancing, fully charged cells share their excess energy with cells that are still charging, shuttling the energy to where it's required. This is highly efficient, but the hardware and software involved is expensive. Balancing only takes place at 100% SOC, not, for example, at the 80% long life mode cutoff limit found on the 24kWh Nissan LEAF. 
Therefore, it is good practice to let your EV fully charge and balance about once a week. But if you can't manage that, don't worry. EV battery packs are proving to be far more robust than any early critics had thought. In terms of the optimum state of charge window in which to run your EV, I routinely run my 4-year-old LEAF between 100% and 40% SOC, ignoring the long life mode function, and its pack is in excellent condition. Your EV battery will be quite content to run between 100% and 20% SOC on a regular basis, and of course you can go to a lower SOC if you like. When rapid charging on a regular basis, run the car between 80% and 20% SOC. This gives you the fastest charging times and therefore saves you time, even if you have to make an extra stop on a journey of several hundreds of kilometres or miles. Note that even when you charge to 100% on a rapid charger, it typically won't balance the pack. Only home and destination charge points will allow this. The worst thing you can do to an EV pack is to always run it between 100% and 80% SOC or higher and then plug in again. Lithium-ion batteries do not like being held at high voltages for long periods of time, so this will accelerate their degradation. In conclusion, ChargeNet NZ's 95% SOC limit is a brilliant bit of common sense, and not an indication that fully charging your EV will damage its battery. I would love to see ChargeNet NZ's strategy replicated by Ecotricity, Polar, Instabolt, ChargePlace Scotland and other rapid charger operators. In fact, I'd go even further, lowering the rapid charge limit to 90% SOC, introducing overstay penalties for anyone who leaves their car plugged in when it is finished charging, and banning PHEVs from using rapid chargers since they can't make anywhere near full use of them. In addition, I'd have at least one destination post at any site containing a rapid charger, which could be used by PHEVs or EVs that genuinely need to charge to 100% SOC, which, given the exponential growth of charging infrastructure around the world, is a highly unlikely scenario. Well there we go, I hope that's demonstrated why ChargeNet NZ's 95% limit is actually quite a lot of sense. And I know a number of people who've followed the advice that I gave you there about rapid charging between 20% and 80% when doing long journeys. And they've actually found that it saves them time to do one or two more stops on really long journeys. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of kilometers or miles here. Um, just adding one more stop in so that they're running between 20% and 80% rather than say 20% and 95 to 100% because they're saving so much time versus waiting on that final 15, 20% of the battery capacity being reached on a rapid charger. It really does work. And as I said, in the video there, charging up to 100% when you're at home or when you're at work, not on a rapid charger, actually helps the battery management system to look after the pack and keep it in good health. Now, before I wrap up for this week, uh, there's been some exciting news, particularly for Scottish EV drivers uh, from Transport Scotland and Energy Saving Trust, which I'd like to go into a bit of detail on just now. I was typing away on my laptop that wasn't even plugged in and I got a very special delivery. It was the results of Transport Scotland and Energy Saving Trust's Low Carbon Travel and Transport Challenge Fund Awards, the second round of them. And honestly, the level of ambition is above and beyond anything I've seen from local authorities in the UK so far. Absolutely phenomenal standards that have been raised here. So Forfer, which is a town of only 15,000 people, is getting eight rapid chargers in a new charging hub alongside fast and slow chargers and a solar canopy. Ayrshire Athletics Arena in Kilmarnock, which has been a major bottleneck in the network so far, they are getting five new rapid chargers, bringing the total up to six, again, solar canopies. We are looking at 60 new charge points in Dundee multi-storey car parks, again covered in solar panels, surprise, surprise. Stirling Council are covering an entire park and ride with solar panels and they're putting in charge points there. Needless to say, I was in awe of the news. So thank you to Transport Scotland, to the Energy Saving Trust, and of course to all of the local authorities who applied, even if they weren't successful, to the ones who applied to try and get the funding to improve this infrastructure. And to everyone who did win, thank you, thank you, thank you for showing so much amazing ambition and foresight. You've got some incredible infrastructure coming and I look forward to using it when it's available. Uh, one or two noticeable absentees on that list, actually. Glasgow and Edinburgh just happen to be the two biggest cities in Scotland. Neither of them got any funding. Now, I did actually hear from Glasgow City Council that they did apply for the funding but were unsuccessful. However, they have a big event coming up on the 6th of October in conjunction with Greenfleet. Uh, it's the Evolution 
public uh, arrive and drive event that's going to be at Riverside Museum on Saturday 6th of October in Glasgow and they're going to be unveiling their big charging strategy there so I look forward to finding out what they've got going on behind the scenes. I've yet to hear anything back from Edinburgh Council although I do know they are working on their own plans. I don't know if they applied for that funding but I'll keep you posted on that one. So thank you very much once again for tuning in. I'll see you again soon for another episode of Plug Life Television.